Okay, so today we are going to work our way through chapter 12. Um, if I don't have a lot for it, um, and how successful we are is really going to kind of depend on how everyone is doing with um, the chapter nine and 10 reactions. Um, so I'll probably do a couple um, practice problems and then give you a couple to work on for a few minutes and then um, we will, then I'll help talk you through them. Um, so are there any questions before we get started? Okay, since we have essentially two days left, we have today and tomorrow, um, I probably will not meet you guys on Friday during reading day, but I will meet you either, like maybe sometime on Sunday for a review. Um, oh, my pens are, it's a good thing we're almost done because my pens are toast. Okay, so we'll review Sunday, an official review Sunday. Um, so if you guys could go, pretty much the only, you know, the, there's regular attendees, but if you could go into the chat and kind of give me an idea if Sunday would work for you um, and timing wise, um, the exam will open. Um, and if Saturday, Sunday's not good and you prefer Saturday, um, that's fine too. So the exam open. Oh yes, Thomas, you're right. Saturday, Sunday is Father's Day. Okay. Um, so let's not do Sunday. Let's plan the the actual review Saturday. Okay. And I am I do stupid things for t-shirts. So I'm running 15 miles Saturday morning. Um, so I would need late afternoon into evening. So, um, but I'm also, yes, of course, Abby, I will review it. I will record it. The, um, I'm not a night owl. So evening, we have to probably finish between nine and nine 30. Yeah. I'm, I'm that's so um, late afternoon, we'll say is like a five to, I'm trying to, I don't know when I'm going to get home from the run. So starting around five or evening, we'll say starting around um, 7.30 or eight. So if you could kind of let me know on the chat, which one of those works for you, that would be great. I will, even though Sunday is Father's Day, if you need something Sunday, you can always um, send me an email. But um, the exam will open Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And you will have the three hours to finish it. Although that is a bit long, um, but it's 50 multiple choice and they're equally weighted, two points each. And it'll close at has to close when Dr. Sosa's Barrio Sosa's class ends 2 30 on Monday. So you have lots of time um, in which to, to log in. So if if you could, so I've got one vote for Saturday evening. Does anybody else have like specifically care? And I will record it. Um, you just have to let me know if you could, please. Okay, so right now there's only one comment or one vote. So we'll do evening and let's try to start a little earlier. Let's try to start around 7.30 and then um, I'm gonna put that in my calendar that not work for somebody Saturday evening okay um, did you say you were not gonna do Fridays 
Um, I wasn't planning on it just because I have a feeling that tomorrow we will have most of the data review as well. Because I don't think 12 is going to take two days. Okay. Um, but like if there is significant desire for something on Friday, I don't mind doing it. I it just, just depends on what everybody wants. wants. The, I was just thinking like Saturday night or late afternoon. And then if the exam opens on Sunday, that's very little. Um, like if uh, I, find, if we find out like, Oh wow, I really need to go back. Like it's, it's yeah, not it's too late. late, but it, there's okay. such a short suspension. Um, so you guys don't have, lab should be over. Um, what about um, Friday, but we start just as uh, hair past nine, like 9.30. So would that be okay if we reviewed, or would you, uh, Friday morning, 9.30 to 10.30, cause that's essentially in our class time anyway. Would that work to have two? Yeah, well, at least for me, I mean. I, okay, yeah, no, 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 I, I totally don't mind doing it. I just, I don't want to, I don't, I can't, I don't want to force you to come on Friday um, because I'm not supposed to with, I mean, it's reading day. It's your, it's a day for you to do and prep the way you want to. Um, but I also don't mind. So I'm gonna just gonna put it in my calendar that we're gonna have Orgo class review. 9.30 to 10.30 on Friday. And then Saturday, we'll do another one. What did I say? Uh, 7.30 to, we're gonna plan 7.30 to 8.30. Usually like on, uh, cause summer classes are hard cause there's the time is so long, but okay. All right, does that work? Everybody's happy? Yes, thank you very much. Yep. Okay. All right, so let's get into 12. Okay, so 12 is not, I mean, obviously it's a new chapter, but it's not really learning anything new. It's application in a new way, stuff that you already know. Okay, so what chapter 12, chapter 12 is called synthesis. And what that is going to entail is putting um, multiple steps together and the steps um, are reactions. So this is essentially uh, chapters 7 through 10 together to make a product. So the way that, and this is just uh, sort of the natural process of the class, the way that you learn or the way the textbooks teach is that you get reactants, you're told conditions, and then you learn to predict products. And sometimes you have mechanistic details, sometimes you don't. But in practice, like to actually be an organic chemist, which I know you're all like super excited to become, to practice, let's say in practice, that's not how you do a reaction. What you do is you design your product. Okay, so you have um, some compound in mind that you want to make. So you say, I want to make, and then something would go like in this box. Okay, this is your goal. So what you do is you think about what was the preceding compound
that you would have to have made and what step would get you to the goal. And then you look at your preceding compound and you say, well, how would I have made that from a preceding compound? And how would I have made that from a preceding compound? And so you're working in your mind in this direction. So this is your plan. Oops, you can't see that. This is in your mind or on paper. This is your plan. But what you would actually do then is you would start here and chemically work your way forward. But in but before you do that, you have to plan backwards. And that process of planning backwards is called ret uh, retrosynthesis. Now, obviously, because of the way in which um, your final is going to be organized, you're going to have, it's going, we're going to do this, but the way that we're going to do it in the notes is going to be slightly different than the way it can be tested. But if you have to take 212, this is a really important skill to be able to develop. So when we do retrosynthesis, we have to consider that we know how to do several things. So when you say, like, what do I know how to do? And at this point, you know a lot of functional group changes. So by substitution, you know how to take alkyl halides to ethers, alkyl halides to esters. Uh, you know how to take um, alkyl halides and make alkenes. And then from alkenes, you know how to make alcohols and carboxylic acids, ketones from if you did a double elimination. So you have a lot of functional group changes that you know. And the other thing that you know how to do using the acetylide anion is you know how to alter the skeleton, the carbon skeleton of your compound. And when you say that, you, that means you can add more carbons. And if you would do like an oxidative cleavage of an alkene, you can remove some carbons. So you, you know how to do a lot of things, okay? So even though you were taught the reactions forward, you need to start considering them how to go backwards. Okay, so at the when we first start this, what I like, what I'm going to do is you're going to be given a reactant and a product, but we're going to work our way from the product back to the reactant. Okay, okay are there questions so far about where we're going? Okay. So we'll do some pretty, um, I think, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six examples of this. Some are harder than others. Okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to say, and we have to start on the product side. How can I make this compound this is where we start oh gosh this is our start point how can you make this from 
this. So we always have to have our starting point now on the product side, not on the reactant side. Okay. So when you look at this, it's, it's important, I think, not to just throw your hands up in the air and be like, this is stupid, I don't want to do this, okay? <clears throat> you know what this is and you can kind of map out in short little bits and pieces what you know about this compound okay so for example you know it's a tertiary alkyl halide The fact that it's an alkyl halide, then you would ask yourself, how do you make, or how do you put X, which would be bromine, on a compound? But you never just add one atom. Okay. You have to add multiple atoms and your addition reactions are all either on alkenes or alkynes so addition reactions to an alkene you can get a halide in a highly substituted position if you add H and Br across a double bond. Okay. So what that's telling you is that there's something missing right here from going from this secondary alkyl halide to a tertiary alkyl halide. Okay. There's a compound missing. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> but to put bromine on a compound and not have any other heteroatoms shown would mean that this reaction would include HBr. Okay. If you look at this product, you can say, well, this is a primary carbon, primary carbon, tertiary carbon, secondary carbon, this is the, the tertiary carbon is the Markovnikov carbon from three different positions. Okay, now because you know kind of where you're starting from, I'm hoping that this carbon and this carbon you can recognize are the same as this carbon and this carbon. So the most likely place to have your pi bond would be in that position, because now that's involving both carbons from your commercially available starting material to your product. Okay. So now if you add HBr across this pi bond, you're going to have a nucleophilic attack or a proton transfer a carbocation in your tertiary position, and then a nucleophilic attack by the bromine. Okay, so I'm not asking you to draw the mechanism, but you do know the mechanism for this. Okay. Then you would ask yourself, what do you know about the compound in the box? Okay. Well, the compound in a box in the box is an alkene. And the way that you make it, you say, well, how do I make this? Okay. Alkenes are made by elimination reactions performed on alkyl halides. You have an alkyl halide, you want to make an alkene, so you need to do an elimination. Okay. 
Before we go too much further, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of alkene do we have? Or what do we know about our alkene? This alkene has one, two, three R groups. So it's tri-substituted. And if you look at the other positions or the possibilities for this pi bond, you know that, or you can predict or consider that this is likely a Zaitsev product. Okay. And you know that Zaitsev products can be made by E2 eliminations in the presence of a small strong base. Okay. Now you don't have, you wouldn't have to use um, hydroxide, you could use methoxide or ethoxide, if you have options there. It's just the smallest one to pick. The two carbons that are in red in your substrate are the two carbons here in the alkene. And you have right here a hydrogen that wasn't drawn. So I've kind of run out of room. So going from here to here, you have an alpha carbon with a leaving group. And you have a beta carbon here and a beta carbon here. To get the Zaitsev product, you would need your small strong base. Okay. So you would use like sodium hydroxide or sodium methoxide in probably water or methanol or something like that. Okay. Are there questions about that, that process Not, um, or the reactions involved? Okay, let's do another one. Again, we're going to start our analysis over here. Okay. And the product we want to make is this alkene. All right, and what I'm gonna tell you is the, the only place to start, or are you, sorry, only reactant available, that's what it is, only reactant is this alkene. Okay, so what do we know about our compound that we want to make? The compound we want to make is a di-substituted alkene. Okay. All alkenes are made from elimination reactions. Okay. So when we consider the compound that would have had to come before this, 
we know we're going to do an elimination reaction, which means that the compound in the box has to have the same sigma bond framework as the product. Okay. So if you look, you have seven carbons in this, you have seven carbons in here. So this would have to have seven carbons. Okay. So that is a seven carbon framework that could be used to form this compound. Okay. The carbons involved in having your pi bond in that position are these carbons here. Okay. Now, sometimes you're gonna predict something and you're, it's not gonna work out. So you should plan when you practice these problems, like you might make mistakes, that's okay. That's a good learning experience. There's also more than one way to go in a reaction or take a synthesis. So if you would propose something that's slightly different than what I would propose, it doesn't mean it's wrong. You just have to check to make sure that it actually works. Okay. And don't feel bad about making mistakes. When I do these, I still make mistakes and I have to check and figure out where my where I messed up. Okay, so anyway, so we have this compound. We need to do an elimination reaction. So this compound must have a halide on an alpha carbon with a hydrogen on a beta carbon. Now, you could try to put the halogen out here because there, there could be a hydrogen here. And that would produce this product if you did an elimination here and here with X up here, like if you put X here. But that is going to be tricky to have X up here when your reactive carbons are in the ring. Okay. So let's put a bromine there, which would be the alpha carbon, and this one up here at the end of this methyl group would be beta, and there's plenty of hydrogens on beta. But you have beta here, here, and here. If you use one of the ring carbons that are beta, you're not going to get a pi bond on the outside. You're going to go into the ring because these would be the more highly substituted alkene products. Okay. If you eliminate from this carbon or this carbon, you're going to end up back over here you want to eliminate up here and down here. So this is considered a Hoffman product of an elimination reaction. Okay. So Hoffman products are not the favored products in E1 mechanisms. E1 mechanisms always favor Zaitsev. In an E2 elimination, you can selectively enhance or increase the percentage of the product that's Hoffman if you use a large base. So if we use terse butoxide here, that's not a radical, that's a negative, then we're going to make the Hoffman product. Okay, so we need this tertiary alkyl halide under conditions that will form a Hoffman product so we can do an E2 elimination. 
Right? So now we say, well, how can we make this tertiary alkyl halide from this substituted cyclohexene? Okay. Let me erase this here and here. Okay. And again, now where you would start would say, Making an alkyl halide, you can do an addition reaction to an alkene to make an alkyl halide. Okay, so you have an alkene, you want to make an alkyl halide. Now the carbons that are important is this one and that one. Okay. Now if you compare those two carbons, you have a tertiary carbon and a secondary carbon. Tertiary, secondary. So you want your halogen to end up on the more highly substituted carbon so that is going from here to here, a Markovnikov addition, which means you just need HBr here. If you perform this reaction HBr in the presence of the peroxide, your bromine's gonna end up here. Then you'd have to eliminate it again to get back here to add it to the right carbon to go ahead and get the elimination conditions for the Hoffman product. Questions about that one? Okay, let's do another one. Now this one we're going to set up slightly different um, only because I'm going to give you a starting product a little bit differently than we start. So one, two, okay. And we have this available. We're actually going to end up kind of looping around for this one. Okay. Right, now, one of the things that we didn't do in the last two examples, but we probably should have, um, is to count your carbons involved in the reactant and your product. So we have six in the ring, seven on this substituent. So we have seven carbons in total, but over here we have six in the ring, seven, eight, nine carbons in our product. Okay. So we, in order to make this product, we have to add two carbons. So then what I would do for this one is I would just think about, you know, how can I get a reactive two carbon unit? The hint or the clue for this is here. So this carbon that's in blue, is this carbon in blue. So we're adding this bit. This is the two carbon unit that we're adding. A reactive two carbon unit can be generated by taking acetylene and reacting it 
with your strong base amide. So the product of this reaction is a two carbon unit that's highly reactive. This species is an excellent nucleophile for SN2 reactions. And SN2 reactions like methyl and primary substrates. Okay. The reactant that you have available is a primary alkyl halide. Okay. So if you take your reaction and you put it into, or your reactant, and you react it with acetylide, SN2 conditions require polar aprotic solvents. You could write like DMSO. And then you would make this nine carbon product. Are there any questions about that? Because now I'm going to give you one to practice. Okay. And I'm going to give you some, some uh, hints. Because okay. I'm not going to tell you what this is until after you figure out how to make this. So I want you to make this compound, okay. and I want you to figure out what compound you need in what conditions to make this specific product. And so what I want you to do over here or on your paper is write down as many things as you can about the identity of this product. All right, and I'll give you a few minutes to work on that. What am I doing? I'm teaching. Oh yeah. Yeah. What are you doing? Playing right back. What is my book? Shoot people in the head and nice. get points. Nice. What are you guys going to do today? I don't know. Look at, look at all my poison on you. Where'd you get that? I don't know. And then there's some right there. Yes. And then there's a spot right there. And a spot right there. We have some spray, though. I just, I just put cream on. Right. I'll probably take a shower soon, too. Okay. I did not. Um, I went to sleep very late and woke up kind of early, so I'm not taking that. Okay. Sounds good. You might try to go surf me. Okay. Pop
what do we know about this product? So if we look at this, what we know, we don't know a ton about it, but we know that it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. Okay. Functional group is an alkene. It's considered disubstituted and cis. Okay. So then you asked yourself, how do you make cis alkenes? Okay. Cis alkenes are made by hydrogenation reactions to or on alkynes. So your alkyne has to be between, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Between carbons four and five. So uh, because alkynes have to be drawn linear, they always look funny when you draw them here. So one, two, three, four to five, to six, to seven, to eight. Okay. Hydrogenations to alkynes, there's two. You can do cis or trans, and they use different conditions. Okay. The cis conditions, are hydrogen with Lindler's catalyst. And if you wrote poison catalyst, that's okay. But poison catalyst and Lindler's catalyst are the same thing. Okay. Now what I want you to do is take a few minutes to plan how you would make this alkyne if this is all you have available. I need to warm up this coffee, it's gross. So let's look at this. And we have eight carbons here. Our reactant has one, two, three, four, five carbons. Now, unlike the last um, problem where we had like a side reaction with acetylene. In this case, the alkyne 
terminal alkyne is given as your reactant. So you need to transform this into a um, into a strong nucleophile by treating this with that sodium or lithium amide, which will remove that proton to make this into a strong nucleophile. Okay. That can be used in a substitution reaction on something that'll take you from five carbons to eight carbons. So the difference from five or between eight and five is three. So you would need a three carbon primary alkyl halide in a polar aprotic solvent to have this thing be a strong nucleophile backside attack here to generate an eight carbon unit. Are there any questions about that one? I have two left for today. Okay. All right. Great. Let's do this one. Okay. And I want you to figure out how do you make that from a compound that you're going to draw in the box. Y'all ready for some help? Or do you want more time? Okay. Okay. So let's go on with some help. All right. All right. So starting up here, and we write down the things we know about this compound, okay? All this stuff over here is just alkyl stuff, but the reactive, the reactive part is here. The functional group is over here. So this is a transalkene. Okay. Transalkenes are made 
from hydrogenation of or on of alkynes. However many carbons that are up here, you would have to have down here because hydrogenation doesn't add any carbons. It just adds hydrogens to the carbons that had been involved in a triple bond. So when you draw what had to have been in this box, a lot of this is gonna stay exactly the same. So let me let me write some numbers up here so I get this in the right spot. One. These wouldn't be the right way. This wouldn't be the right way to um, number it. You'd have to name it. You'd have to start over here. One, two. Maybe I should do it the right way then. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So then down here, what have I got so far? Seven, six, five, four, three. To two, to one. Okay. Now the conditions for the transalkene is the reactive metal. So sodium, lithium, something like that in an ammonia solution will make a transalkene, excuse me, from an alkyne. Okay. Are there questions about that step? I have a quick question. Sure, Karen. How do you know, like, when I look at that product, I say, well, couldn't that have been made from an, an elimination reaction? Yes, it could have been. Okay. Yes, yes. And so the, sometimes you're told where to start. Sometimes you're not told where to start. So, the, like, and these are more... 212 type questions. But like it could have said, the question could be like from any reaction, or wait, for any, from any reactant of your choice. And sometimes it'll say like, uh, let's say, because we're going to get there. Uh, it'll tell you like a number of carbons from any blah, blah, blah reactant of your choice. Design a synthesis of, and then you'll have a product. Okay. Or questions can be asked from the following reactant, and reactions of your choice design a synthesis of some compound. And maybe you're given the structure or you're told something about this. In these kind of things, sometimes you're told you can only use five steps maximum. So yes, in this, but I know where we're coming from, which makes it a little bit, but if you had said over here that you can make um, this alkene from an elimination reaction um, on an alkyl halide, you would have been right. So as and the only thing you would have had to do is, let's see, make sure 
that you have the right product form. So <clears throat> we're gonna, we need this carbon involved. I would put, I would have put the halogen, uh, oh wait, now that's, that, this should work, but you would get a mixture of products. This would be one of them, but you would also make this one. Whereas if you do this reaction, this will be the only thing you make. So, but there's always more than one way to do it. In this case, then you would have had to have started from an alkene. And so my intention was that the starting product or the starting material is an alkene. It just doesn't have the right Oops, gosh. Number of carbons. Like this was where we were, I was going to start. Say, so how do you make this? If you had known that, then this maybe had, would have been a little bit more apparent. But yeah, there's usually more than one way to do it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Okay. And I can, on the next question, I'll write the question more like um, how you can expect to see it on um, your exam. Um, but let's finish up this one. So there's a reactant here that I need you to use to make this. Okay. And so what I want you to consider, I'll give you this structure here. I want you to consider how you would make this from this. So this is the first thing I want you to do up here. Then once you've figured out how to make this from this compound, then you can come up and do this one.
Okay, do you want more time or do you want help? Okay, all right. So where I would start with this is I would number, even though it's not going to be correct in terms of numbering for this compound, I would try to use the numbering from here to help you figure out um, what needs to be added to here. So seven, six, five, four. So relative to the product, skipped ahead in my notes. We have this part here is new. So we have a bond that we need to make between four and three here. So this is gonna be our new sigma bond and this is gonna be our new piece added. Okay, so our new piece added is gonna to have to have one, to three carbons. Two, three carbons. And we just need this to be a carbon ion so it can do a nucleophilic attack here in conditions that support a polar aprotic compound. So you could get that, you would take um, propylene in the presence of the sodium amide, and you would make your anion. Okay. Okay, so then from here, we have to figure out how we want to make this compound from an alkene. And if we again number, According to where we started over here, seven, six, five, four, we have to do a reaction on five and four that'll put a bromine in a less substituted carbon that had been in the pi bond. So the only way to get a bromine on the less substituted carbon in a pi bond is to use the HBr in conditions of peroxide. Are there questions about that one? And now the rest that we do today, um, I'll write them more like how you'll see them on Monday. All right, I need to get my, uh, let's see what I got here. All right. All right, so. Okay, and we're gonna have A, B, C, and D reactions. I hear the weirdest noise outside my house. Hmm. Okay.
Hope you can see all this. Okay, so those are your options for this synthesis. So what I want you to do is I want you to figure out which set of reactions, A, B, C, or D, will take you from um, one butene to this aldehyde. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, hexanal. This is called hexanal. Does anybody want more time? Okay, so that sounds like hard no. Okay, so where we're gonna start, and in this case, it's always best to start at the end. Okay, so if you look at this species, this is an aldehyde. Okay, so you only have one way to make aldehydes on a compound. And it's a hydrogenation, wait, hydration reaction on an alkyne. But the hydrate, you have two kinds of hydration reactions for alkynes. You have one that's in the presence of the mercury and the other that's in the presence of the boron trihydride or the, the hydroboration reaction. So just knowing that aldehydes come by hydrations of alkynes, you can toss out C because this is an ozonolysis. And ozonolysis on alkynes makes carboxylic acids. 
So C is out. Mercury sulfate in the presence of sulfuric acid and water is a hydration reaction on alkynes. But if it's a terminal alkyne, then what you're going to make is a ketone through the tautomerization. So since you're making an aldehyde and these conditions will favor the ketone, A is out. So in this case, you start at the bottom and you're going to have to work your way up. So both of these have B and D, both have boron hydroboration oxidation as the last step, which on a terminal, or yes, which on a terminal alkyne will make an aldehyde. Step two is using a terminal alkyne as a uh, nucleophile in a substitution reaction. And so that step would occur on an alkyl halide. Okay. And then you look at the conditions for step one, which would be used on this alkene to make your alkyl halide. Okay. Now, both of these are in the presence of peroxide, but HCl does not make the anti-Markovnikov product in the presence of peroxide. The only binary acid that will do that is the HBr, so it has to be option D. Now you could certainly have addressed this moving forward, but I think it's easier. You get to throw things out faster if you start at the bottom. Okay. Are there any questions about this problem? Okay, all right, let's do another one. Let me check. Am I... oh, Here, okay. To make sure these aren't the questions I already did. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot, I just read my book. I don't want to make stuff up and then have it not work. Okay.
on this one for a little bit. <laughs> Does anybody want more time on this one? Or are you ready for help? Do you know what a boot ball ball is? I don't know. You're not in the table. Well, we can get more. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So what we're doing in the course of this reaction is moving a functional group um, from a secondary position to a primary position, and we're making alcohols. So if you look across the step three, there are all hydrogenation reactions that are appropriate for alkenes to form alcohols. Okay. In option B though, the conditions of the mercury acetate water and then that oh that's supposed to be sodium borohydride that is um, oxymercuration demercuration which makes the markovnikov alcohol which would put it back up here if the pi bond is on these carbons then this is the markovnikov carbon which favors um, the placement of the hydroxide under these conditions so b is wrong a, C, and D all have the correct anti-Markovnikov um, hydration conditions. I got lazy in here. I just wrote hydroxide, and here I wrote it out, sodium hydroxide. That doesn't matter. It could be lithium hydroxide. As long as you have basic conditions, the reaction will work. If you look across A, B, or A, C, and D, they all address the fact that hydroxide is a terrible leaving group, and they fix that using the tosyl chloride in pyridine. So the difference is in the size of the base used um, in the elimination reaction so that you can form an alkene to do hydration. So elimination reactions, if you look at the carbons involved, you really are only we're thinking about what will happen with those three carbons. And so if the alkene ends up in the middle, it's a Zaitsev product. So it would be a more highly substituted alkene than if it's down here. So if you want the Hoffman product, you need a large base. Sodium ethoxide is small, sodium hydroxide is small. So you would pick D.
Are there any questions about this one? And then I'm going to draw something up that you guys can work on for the last bit of the time today. And then um, we'll fill in the answers at the end. Now, this is from your book. There's an, um, I'm not going to be able to draw all of them on here, but I would recommend that you do these just as a refresher. So we're going to have a compound in the middle, and then we're going to, um, oops, I have so much stuff up. draw as many transformations as we can. So that's our sort of central point. What I want you guys, as I start drawing out the products, I want you to go in and write the reactants, how you do, how you do these things. Can you make this happen? Okay, so try to fill in as many arrows as you can. And I'm gonna give you guys about 10, uh, it's 10.25, I'm gonna give you about five, 10 minutes for this um, to work that through.
Church. Okay, so let's go through this. Great. And we'll start trying to think where to start so I won't write as much on here as possible. Just start here, work our way clockwise. Okay, so this one, we're starting with uh, methylcyclohexane and we're putting a bromine into a tertiary position. So the only reactions that you have for this alkane is a radical reaction. And because the bromine ends up on the group, or on the molecule, excuse me, in a tertiary position, it means that you must have used NBS in light, which would generate a bromine radical and bromine radicals, oops, sorry, are selective towards highly substituted positions. So NBS in light will get you here. Now you, let me see, you, you would get, um, you would get this if you, well, wait, you could use bromine in light too, but you're going to get, um, this is the easiest way to cattle sort of generate the bromine radicals. Um, let's see. So now here we have a tertiary alkyl halide and we want to get a pi bond into the ring. And this would be considered now a Zaitsev product of the elimination here because you, um, you have a carbon out here which would generate a Hoffman product. So we need a little base in an elimination reaction you could use hydroxide here, methoxide, um, ethoxide, and this would be an E2 elimination. Okay. If, if you want more, if you need more or stop me at any point either, it's easier if you catch my attention by uh, unmuting yourself, but you can always um, chat. Um, okay, so here we're starting with the alkene, cyclic alkene, and we want to put a bromine on the less substituted carbon in the pi bond. So we need to make an anti-Markovnikov product. The only way we can do that is HBr in peroxide. Okay. This product going from the alkene up to this product. This is putting the bromine on the Markovnikov, pro uh, Markovnikov product. That's just an HBr addition. Okay. This arrow is forming a ketone and an aldehyde, but the ring is opening. So that's an ozonolysis reaction, ozone with DMS. Okay. Here, we're making a diol, but we're making a cis diol because both of the hydroxides are on the wedges. Cis diols are made um, with the osmium tetroxide in NBS. And then you need something like sodium bisulfite, sodium uh, or sodium sulfite in water. This product is a halo hydrin, adding by anti-addition bromine in the presence of water will give you a halo hydrin. Here you're going back to an alkane, so you had to do a hydration, hydrogenation reaction, so hydrogen over a reactive metal like platinum. Here you are making an alcohol, but you're making, you're putting the hydroxide on the less highly substituted carbon from your alkene. So this is hydroboration, BH3, T2, 
TH, that doesn't look like anything. That looks like a blob with a three, but it's BH3, THF in step one, and then a base and peroxide. This way you're coming from your alkene to a Markovnikov alcohol. Now it's not shown, um, let me think. So this is not chiral because this carbon is shared is the same as this. This is the same as this. And this is shared. So this is achiral. Um, you could make that in two ways. You could either use acid catalyzed hydration or you could use oxymercuration. with your sodium borohydride in the demercuration step. Are there any questions? This was on page 548 in your textbook. On page 549, there's a similar sort of um, spiral, but the starting material is an alkyne. Are there any questions for today? Okay, so if you could in the chat or unmute yourself, um, just kind of let me know uh, what you would like, I mean, to review. I mean, we can, we can keep doing synthesis stuff, but we can go back and do stereochemistry. We can do naming. Um, so the first part of the chapters one through five didn't have, and 15, didn't really have any transformations. The acid base did a little bit. Um, and then, but the actual organic reactions didn't really start until six was sort of introduced in the steps and then seven was substitution. So everything after that got a little, you know, a little spicy. So anybody have anything um, that they want me to kind of make a note of that you want reviewed? Maybe just the reactions in general. Okay. Um, one of the things, let me just see if I can find one real quick, that might help. And I've seen these, although I haven't really use them extensively are, um, I have no idea what's gonna pop up on my Pinterest page. So be forewarned. Okay, how not to kill your spider plant. I have, y'all, I have 60 house plants. My house is ridiculous. And I'm redoing the bathroom, so there you go. Uh, let's see, organic chemistry reactions and there's maps so like like this is nice and it's pretty because she he or she has nice handwriting um things like this are really helpful um and but they're not helpful if you just look at them in a um in a sort of a flat way, you kind of have to rewrite things. And you are going to see things that are different than what we did. Um, like here, this, this is an alkoxy mercuration. Well, you did an oxy mercuration, so you made alcohols. But some of the, some of the parts on here can be really helpful. So you kind of need to, it would be helpful if you made a map. Um, and then used it as studying, but they're, they're all over the place. Here's another one, um, starting with alkenes. You just kind of have to find something that's a little bit um, more suited for our class, but there's tons of things like that. Um, and um, so to Tabitha's point, chapter nine additions, some kind of map, and you can find them on Pinterest, um, would help. So chapter nine, Karen Alkynes, which was 10, and MO theory. 
So the chapter 10 reactions, um, there's similarities and differences to nine, but what most people seem to um, find is that the better they understand nine addition reactions for alkenes, the easier alkynes are because you don't have as many um, mechanisms. You just have more because it's, you know, and when I say that, like, you don't have the mechanisms, when you have a textbook that doesn't show you the mechanism, it's because the mechanism is not well known. Like the product prediction, you can say this will happen, we just don't know how it happens. And that's just the nature of the game. We're still working out all the details. Um, there are, I think I showed you the Michigan State um, practice chemistry um, site, um, but you can do things like um, type in like practice alkene addition. And then there's lots of good um, YouTube videos. Um, and even a lot of these, you just would have to look, and I can look as well and be like this, I like this page, but here's a good, we just did this, um, and then predict the products, propose a mechanism. And some of these sites that put these things online, um, will also end up hopefully giving you a key. So um, this actually looks like a pretty good thing. So I'll email that to you guys. Um, and like I would do stuff like, like that, as, um, as many practice problems as you can get your hands on, do. And in Alex, if you get to the, if you get 100% high progress, but you still have a knowledge check left, don't do the knowledge check, because I don't want it to bump you down. Okay, so if you get to 100%, stop. <laughs> You're good. Um, and so I would do things like that. But we can look at MO theory and chapter 10 and um, move on, you know, and just kind of see. But if, if you are, when you're studying today and something pops up and you're like, oh, I want to talk about that, uh, just shoot me an email. But tomorrow we'll meet for the whole time from 9 until 10.40. And so hopefully we can get a lot of things covered and reviewed, and then Friday will be a little bit shorter of a review, and then Saturday we'll wrap everything up. All right, any other questions? Okay, if there aren't any other questions, we'll end for today, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep, no problem. You're welcome.